All right, Ed, back to you. I'm sorry for the interruption. I, Mike, I fully understand and my best wishes. Uh, I mean, I just went through some uh, radial surgery for a tumor in my head. So uh, I know what sort, of, well, I'm not gonna say I'm as bad as it, but I can appreciate what they're going through. Oops, went too far. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the railroad lines of auto mirrors. And uh, I hope you've all had a chance to uh, download the uh, handout from uh, the website. Auto mirrors is an interesting individual. He was born in Kurland, Estonia. And by the way, my stepfather was named Kurland. So I don't know about any connection and he's long gone. So, uh, but anyway, on May 3rd, 1840, he was orphaned at an early age and sent to live with an uncle in San Francisco. Except the uncle said, eh. And Otto was left on the docks of San Francisco at the age of nine. He made his way to, to Colorado and became a farmer. And he was a successful farmer, but he didn't have any place to process his wheat. But there was a mill over the other side of Pancha Pass, so he built a road. And this led to his uh, constructing a number of toll roads, some of which would lay, he would later turn into railroads, but basically he made his money on uh, owning the toll booth. Okay, his first railroad was a Silverton Northern, then came the Rio Grande Southern, and finally the Silverton Northern Railroad. After the Silver Panic of 1893, he came east and became involved in the Chesapeake Beach Project and the International Motor Truck Company, which is better known as Mack Trucks. He returned to Colorado, settled in Silverton until moving to Pasadena, California at an advanced age. He died in Pasadena on June 24th, 1931. His daughter continued living in Silverton until the late uh, 1940s, but more of that later. Actually, right now, and the Pitcher family, or the descendants of the Pitcher family, probably uh, Otto's great grandchildren, great grandchildren, they are very involved in the Colorado ski industry. But we're not genealogy fans; we're rail fans. So let's start with the little trains. And as Mike told me. The red uh, lettering on the screens are a little harsh, but uh, they're basically harsh things in the history of the railroads. So the Silverton Railroad was incorporated on July 5th, 1887, opened from Silverton to Borough Bridge on January 28th, 1888, and to Red Mountain Town on November 1st, 1888, and then finally to Albany and Irontown, uh, Ironton on September 20th, 1889. These are really tremendously small distances, but the topography is absolutely horrible. If you've ever driven the million dollar highway from Silverton to Ure, you've basically uh, traveled along the right of way of the Silverton Railroad. The Silverton Railroad ceased operations after the summer of 1920. And here are all three, what a often referred to as the three little lines uh, in the book by uh, Josie uh, Moore Crum. And here we are, Silverton, the Silverton Railroad, which uh, goes up uh, and we're gonna show you some of, the, uh, some of these things. This map, of course, is also in your handout. This is the Silverton Gladstone Northerly and then the Silverton Northern. And don't worry, we'll, we'll show this again. And the Silverton Railroad connection to the Denver and Rio Grande Western is now the 6th Street Y. From the end of the Y, it, the line used to go up here through the uh, canyon, which is where the, uh, the Million Dollar Highway is located. Silverton Railroad number 100, the Ure out on the line. Otto Mears himself is here on the left. A view of the switchback corks, corkscrew gulch turntable on the Silverton Railroad. Now, notice there's a snow shed on the access to the uh, turntable, and we'll show you another picture above. This was really a rather interesting structure. Here's another view 
This is the, the turntable, the upper uh, leg of the uh, switchback and the lower leg of the switchback. The topography was so tight that there really was not enough room to put a normal uh, tail track. Here's a 2013 view of the Red Mountain town area. Now, Red Mountain was the big mining uh, area on the uh, Silverton uh, Railroad. Uh, mining continued there after the Silverton was abandoned. And much of the uh, spoil piles that you see in that view cover uh, where the community was and the uh, railroad. But going back to 1890, here's uh, Red Mountain Town Station and why with uh, one of the Silverton, uh, with the, the Silverton uh, Railroad locomotive and one of their boxcars over here in the background. Again, this is that area which I showed earlier, which is totally uh, changed. There's actually a survivor of the Silverton Railroad, baggage and express car number five, which is a former Denver and Rio Grande Western uh, car was located at Teft Spur, which we'll visit uh, later in the show. And the San Juan County Historical Society has acquired it, the, has salvaged it really. They've moved it to Silverton and uh, they're at least holding on to it. Let's head to the next uh, entry. This was the bit, this is the big one, the Rio Grande Southern. It was the second of the Otto Mears rail lines to be built. Construction from Ridgeway to Vance Junction was completed on November 16, 1890. The Tell You Ride or To Hell You Ride branch was completed on November 23, 1890. Durango to Porter was completed on December 1, 1890. Now the Tell You Ride brand, even though, branch, even though it was a branch, was basically a part of the main line. Any passenger train on the main line would go, would go into Telluride and then come back. Freights, uh, unless they had business in Telluride itself, would continue on the main line at Vance Junction. Vance Junction to Lizard Head Pass was completed on July 3rd, 1891. Puerto Rico was opened on September 30th, 1891. Rico to Lizard Head was completed on December 19th, 1891. And the first train over the entire line from Durango to Ridgeway ran on January 2nd, 1892. Very fast construction in those days. And this was very terrible ground to have to build over as you'll see in some of the pictures. Okay, now the bad stuff. The Sherman Silver Purchase Act was repealed uh, October 31st, 1893 since most of the Colorado economy was based on the purchase of silver by the government. This completely devastated the state. In fact, there are some people who say Colorado has still has not yet recovered from this uh, piece of legislation. A silver panic had occurred during the summer of 1893, which affected all of the railroads and mines in Colorado, and naturally the ancillary uh, industries that depended on those mines and railroads. The financial condition of the, of the road, the De Rio Grande Southern, saw Otto Mears transfer control of it to the Denver and Rio Grande Western by the end of 1893. The line financially lipped along as a stepchild of the Denver and Rio Grande Western. It entered receivership on December 11th, 1929. The initial receiver was Victor v w Miller the son-in-law of the bankruptcy judge who was an innovative business manager and not a railroad person. He did some very interesting stuff as we'll see. Saved the railroad for a while. Victor minima Miller minimized the leasing of rolling stock from the Denver Rio Grande Western. He acquired some rolling stock from the Colorado and Southern and from equipment dealers. The AIM slide, long a physical difficulty, was dealt with by construction work ideas instead of railroad maintenance practices. Starting in 1931, the motors, better known as the gooses, were put into service on the Rio Grande Southern. Victor Miller divorced his wife during 1938. He was discharged as receiver on November 16, 1938, by the bankruptcy judge, his former father-in-law. Uh, not really surprising to anyone. 
The new receiver was a Denver and Rio Grande Western executive. World War II and Yellow Cake mining kept the Rio Grande Southern uh, running temporarily. Yellow Cake is a form of uranium. And as you recall, we used a nuclear bomb in World War II. The Rio Grande Southern suspended regular service as of May 12th, 1950. Stock extras were to run as needed. The railroad went into the tourist business using the motors at a bridgeway running up to Lizard Head. 1951 saw 2,443 goose riders and 400 cars of sheep transported despite the line's remote location. Despite their actually having a fairly decent year, the bankruptcy court ordered the road shut down as of December 17, 1951. Interesting fact, the Rio Grande Southern has never been abandoned. And this is the map that you can find in your handout of the Rio Grande Southern. Here's Ridgeway where it connected with the Ure branch of the Denver and Rio Grande Western, Dallas Divide, Placerville, Vance Junction with the branch to Telluride, Lizard Head Pass, Rico. Now what's interesting is Basically, the Rio Grande Southern was operated as two railroads between Ridgeway and Rico and between Rico and Durango. Every train stopped in Rico, motive power was changed. In fact, there was never any through passenger service on the Denver and Rio Grande Western. And here we are going down through Dolores, Bancos, and finally to uh, Durango where they connected with the, with the uh, San Juan extension of the uh, Denver and Rio Grande Western. Rio Grande Southern Second 20 is usually on display at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Uh, this is a former uh, Florence and Cripple Creek locomotive, and it has recently been restored to operating condition. Rio Grande Southern 42 is an exhibit in the Durango Roundhouse Museum. And Colorado and Northwestern 30, then it became Colorado and Southern 74, and finally Rio Grande Southern 74 arrived at the Colorado Railroad Museum circa 2008. It's been magnificently restored, but unfortunately it's only been cosmetically restored. Rio Grande Southern Coach 256 is undergoing restoration in Dolores, the local historical society, and we'll see some more of their stuff uh, in a few moments, uh, has custody of this car. The former Rio Grande Southern 257 was restored during 1986 by the Durango and Silverton, and it's in service on the Silverton train uh, regu regularly. Uh, at one time, this car actually had a combine or a baggage compartment at one end. Rio Grande Southern Business Car Rico is restored and on display at the Colorado Railroad Museum. This was shortly before it was uh, repainted. You can see it's being outside uh, does take its toll on, on painted wood painted equipment. Little of the Rio Grande Southern freight equipment has survived, basically three cars have survived. This is the other side of a former Colorado and Southern uh, refrigerator car at the Colorado Rail Museum. Yes, it was legitimately Rio Grande Southern 2101, but it was prior to that, it was a Colorado and Southern car. And you can catch, see the CNS reporting marks on this end right here. And on the far end, it has Rio Grande Southern reporting marks. The Colorado and Southern version of a narrow gauge stock car, the second 7054 was sold to the Rio Grande Southern in 1938 as their 7201, later 7302. And for some reason, instead of 54, it was numbered 64 at the uh, Colorado Railroad Museum. The other side is uh, lettered Rio Grande Southern, but it's impossible to photograph. Now, Otto Mears was a very thrifty guy. He very rarely bought anything new. Almost his entire rolling stock was purchased used 
from the Denver and Rio Grande Western or Florence and Cripple Creek. He did buy one Shea locomotive new. That didn't work out too well. He did have the Denver and Rio Grande Western build five cabooses for the Rio Grande Southern. Three four-wheel, uh, excuse me, four four-wheeled ones and one eight-wheeled one. Basically, those cabooses are the only equipment built new for any of uh, Mears narrow gauge lines in Colorado. And work car 01789 uh, is at the Colorado Railroad Museum. This was originally a Denver and Rio Grande Western boxcar, came over to the Rio Grande Southern as a uh, boxcar number 1789, and then was eventually converted to a work car. I mentioned the Galloping Goose Tourist Service out of Ridgeway when the Rio Grande Southern went into the tourist railroad business. It set up a couple of signs in the area to advertise it. Uh, none of those signs survived, but uh, pictures of them did so that the Ridgeway Railroad Museum has been able to recreate the uh, home of the Galloping Goose sign. And they proudly have that as an exhibit. Speaking of recreations, the Ridgeway Railroad Museum has also recreated the long gone Colorado, Rio Grande Southern Goose number one. They basically found the right model, almost, excuse me, almost the right model Buick. They had plans for drawings and they were able to uh, recreate uh, the car as you see here. It is operational and it has run at the Colorado Railroad Museum. And it does run back and forth at the Ridgeway Railroad Museum on a very short set stretch of track. Here's Rio Grande uh, Motor or Goose Number Two at the Colorado Railroad Museum, a very popular uh, angle for this shot. It's right near uh, No Agua Water Tank. Here's Goose Number Four on display in Telluride. Unfortunately, I haven't made it to Knott's Berry's farm in uh, California to get a shot of goose number three. Uh, by the way, even though it's in a little park next to the courthouse in Telluride, this uh, goose is fully operational and has come out about every five, comes out about every five years and gets run. Hard to photograph though, it's sort of crowded in there. Here we are in Dolores. The local historical society has uh, goose number five. They placed it on display in front of a recreation of the uh, railroad station in Dolores. We'll see the station in a few minutes. Motor number six is, was built primarily as a work car at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Now, the interesting thing about number six is it used a lot of the parts of the original number one. It is said this entire cab assembly is right off of uh, the original number one. And this is a coal car from the Little Book, uh, Book Cliff Railway, which was located in Grand Junction, a sort of isolated industrial uh, three foot gauge line that connected a coal mine with a uh, coal dealer. Supposedly, this car was purchased by the Rio Grande Southern, rehabilitated and used as a ballast car to be towed behind the number six. And the final uh, member of the uh, Rio Grande Southern Motors, uh, number seven, which is preserved at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Now this one has the rear uh, or boxcar section of this car has been rebuilt, was rebuilt in 1950 for the tourist operation. And it has, and it retains that, uh, re that re those rebuilt features. The, tour the Colorado Railroad Museum has more need of a uh, car that can uh, carry passengers than it does to have to carry freight. The Rio Grande Southern Line began at the uh, Denver and Rio Grande Ridgeway Station, and if you've ever heard the term the narrow gauge circle, the west side of the narrow gauge circle was basically the Rio Grande Southern. 
Here's De Denver Rio Grande Western extra 318 passing the Ridgeway station. The station still stands as a house in Ridgeway. It's been turned uh, 90 degrees. And in the days when it was a station, the plumbing for the station was located outside, uh, you know, outhouse. And it also doubled as a coal storage facility. This particular building, the, the person who bought the station was not interested in it because he was installing indoor plumbing. So it ended up at the Ridgeway uh, Railroad Museum. Here's another item that uh, Otto Mears bought new. This is rotary plow number two, Advanced Junction. It's taken during a 1947 fan trip. In 1949, um, poor maintenance and poor attention uh, let the boiler explode in the, this beauty. And here's the 42 with 40 pushing near Placerville. By the way, pictures that you see with this, where the title is surrounded are not mine, they're from other sources. This particular uh, one and the previous one and one of the others that you've seen were from a collection uh, sold by Al Chion back in the early 70s and spent some time uh, scanning them in. Here's Telluride, it's station on the branch. It's now an art gallery and I'll tell you, they're rather snooty in this art gallery. Uh, they sort of don't like to hear that, hey, this used to be a railroad station. And here's a view of offer loop trestles probably soon after construction. And a Rio Grande Southern 74, that's the former Colorado and Southern, former Colorado and Northwestern locomotive. It's on a fan trip uh, navigating off her loop in the late 1940s. I don't have an accurate date for uh, this trip. Now here's the site of off her loop. Right along here is the rails where the railroad was. And here's the lower section right here. Excuse me, I, I skipped, that's not here. The railroad was right along here where it looped in this area. And this is the Ames slide. This used to bedevil the, ra the railroad with the rock falling down almost every spring. And when Miller took came in, the rock had fallen down. The Rio Grande Southern was going to, was trying to put together the money to put a, to rent a ditcher and go up and clean the tracks the way they had always done. Miller, who had some friends in the construction industry said, you don't need all this railroad, special railroad equipment. Just take a bulldozer up there on a flat car and uh, set it to work. While this isn't the, the actual bulldozer that uh, did the work clearing the AIM slide for the rest of the life of the Rio Grande Southern, it is the same model Caterpillar RD4. And for that reason, the uh, Ridgeway Railroad Museum has acquired it and uh, preserves it as, as one of their uh, exhibits. And here's the rear of a May 30th, 1947 Rocky Mountain Railroad Club special train at the Offer Depot. Uh, this building over here is a general, what was a general store then, it still is. And that's the only thing that's really remaining at this site. There, this structure over here is a tipple from a coal mine located back here in the mountains. And basically the hopper, the gondolas were loaded right on the main line. The Trout Lake water tank still stands awaiting the steamer that will never arrive. This is actually a rather, the, this is the right of way here and it's a big loop and it runs through basically an upscale uh, recreational community. And here we are watering a train at Trout Lake. This is the rear of the train. And this is the business car Edna, which we saw earlier at the Colorado Railroad Museum. 
And the Trout Lake trestle has been preserved as a monument to the Rio Grande Southern. And here's looking at uh, the top deck of the Trout Lake trestle. As we mentioned earlier, Lizard Head was the terminal of the 1950 tourist operation from Ridgeway. And here in the background is why they called it Lizard Head. In 2013, the Lizard Head uh, right of way can be seen here. And here's your mountain, your rock formation. Of course, back in the day, this was a tough area to operate. And here's the 42 coming uh, out of the Lizard Head uh, snow shed. And if you look back here, this is the Lizard Head uh, Railroad Station. This is from the uh, Friends of the uh, Converse and Toltec Scenic. Of the extensive facilities once in Rico, only the water tank remains. Uh, for those of you who follow Lionel, for many years, Lionel offered a kit to build a uh, O-scale uh, version of the Rico uh, passenger depot. But that building is long gone. And speaking of that building, here we have uh, Motor Goose 4 transferring express to a Rio Grande uh, Southern truck at Rico, July 13th, 1946, and a photograph by J.C. Thode. And in the background, you can see the water tank that's the same water tank uh, in the previous picture and the station. The Dolores Depot has been recreated by the Dolores Galloping Goose Museum, which is the local historical uh, society. The station itself was off camera to the left about 50 feet, basically the other side of the parking lot and they've also been fortunate enough to acquire a goose to have on display out front. It's really a nice little museum. It's open only on Sundays, I believe, and sometimes the guy who's supposed to open it doesn't show up, so uh, plan on making one or, one or two attempts to visit it. It's worth a few minutes. Of course, the good stuff, the photograph, which is the building and the goose or the motor, you can get without it being open. In Mancos, this building was erected as a recreation of the first Rio Grande Southern Depot here. It, it, then the building was originally converted from a barn. Uh, the second Mancos station has been dismantled and has been moved several times across the state of Colorado. I'm still tracking it down. I may have got a lead on it and I hope to uh, have a pic add a picture of it to this presentation sometime in the future. I'm gonna to try to get to Colorado late, uh, late this year. And finally, we're in Durango. This is the West Durango Engine House. Yes, the Rio Grande Southern had their own facility in uh, Durango. That's steamer 25 to the left and that's the back end of uh, motor uh, four. And this is a circa 1936 picture by Richard B. Jackson. And finally, the Denver Rio Grande Western Durango Station, 162.6 miles from Ridgeway via the Rio Grande Southern. Although that's not a Rio Grande Southern train in the station. Let's move to the other end of the Durango and Silverton to continue our presentation. Again, this is the map I showed earlier for Otto Mir's Three Little Lines, which were based in Silverton. It's also uh, in your handout. This is actually a picture of a map that's on display outside the uh, Durango and Silverton uh, Depot in uh, Silverton. And we've already covered the uh, Silverton Railroad. We're going to go up to Silverton Northern next, and this is the branch to Green Mountain. And then we'll look at the Silverton, Gladstone, and Northerly later in this presentation. Silverton Northern Railroad was incorporated September 20th, 1895, and took over a two-mile branch of the Silverton Railroad. The track was extended to Eureka as of July 1st, 1896. Eureka to Animus Forks opened after November 9th, 1904. 
and the Green Mountain Branch opened during the summer of 1905. All of this was to serve uh, mining country. Otto Mears acquired uh, the Silverton Gladstone and Northerly Railroad on July 23, 1915 and merged it into the Silverton Northern. The Silverton Northern suspended service on January 1st, 1936. The Green Mountain Branch was abandoned on November 17, 1936. The property was sold by the county for back taxes on August 13th, 1942 and dismantled. Again, the railroad line has never been abandoned. It just isn't there anymore. Here's a Southwest view of Silverton. And here is the Silverton Northern Round uh, Engine House. Uh, but before we go any further, let's look at a couple of other things. This is the uh, Denver and Rio Grande Western or, Rio, or Durango and Silverton uh, Station, which I think we're all familiar with. Here's a few, here's a goodie for you. Did you know that there used to be a roundhouse in Silverton? This was used by, by the used by the Denver and Rio Grande Western. And I haven't been able to identify the function of this building, but clearly it's uh, railroad related. And over here in this group of buildings was the offices of the Silverton Gladstone and Northerly. And there's a house over in this area, which we'll visit a little bit later. And here's looking Northeast. There's the actual crossing of the Silverton Gladstone and Northerly and the Silverton Northern. This is 11th Street here, which is where the uh, Durango and Silverton, and before that, the Denver and Rio Grande Western uh, bring their train up. Oh, oh this is the San Juan at the time, the San Juan County Courthouse, which is now uh, the San Juan uh, County Historical Society Museum. And the Gladstone and Northerly goes up uh, the canyon in this area. And there's a canyon over here in this corner for the, that the Silverton Northern serves. Over here, this is Blair Street. And I bring your attention to Blair Street, not because it's railroad related, but because it was the most notorious red light district in the entire state of Colorado at one time. Here's the Silverton Northern Engine House, which still graces Silverton. Uh, normally inside of it, you would find a uh, 280, a narrow gauge 280, which is owned by the uh, San Juan uh, County Historical Society, but uh, they've lent that out over the last few years to the Compress and Toltec Scenic. Here we are out on the Silverton uh, Northern, and this is at the Silver Lake Mill and Denver and Rear Grand Western 281. One of the little 280s is uh, switching the mill. Now here's something interesting. When you hear mining and ore being taken out of mine, you normally associate some sort of rock or composite material being dumped into a, a hopper car and being hauled away, or a gondola and being hauled away to a uh, refinery. However, the mines along the Denver and Rio Grande Western in this area and the three little lines mined precious metals. There was no security in an open top car. So the traditional way of shipping was to bag the ore and place it into a locked box car. So that's why you see here, waiting to be loaded, nothing but box cars. If you do see a uh, hopper car, it's usually either loaded or gondola, it's usually loaded with coal for the mine or the, uh, the mill, or it's being used to carry mine timbers, such as this one. Here we are at Howardsville, which was the site of the uh, Junction with the Green Mountain Branch, and you're actually the main line of the railroad is just to the right of where I'm standing, and the junction goes off to the right. Uh, it is what it is, and here's the remains of the old hundred mine loading bins above the Sacramento Northern Track. 
The old 100 mine above Silverton has acquired a Porter steam locomotive for future operation. The mine, which is a tourist attraction, is applied to San Juan County to build tracks along the road near the mine. Now the road near the mine was built on the site of the former uh, railroad tracks. So it's a small circle. At the old 100 mine, tours are now offered to visitors. I think there's a package you can buy in connection with a ride on the Durango and Silverton that will uh, take you through uh, this mine. Despite the sign, this is not a railroad related building in Howardsville. Someone put a recreation of what, uh, would, what could have been a railroad uh, station type sign. Not that the Howardsville station was much more than this. Here we are at uh, Eureka. And this water tank is uh, basically the only thing and a re recreational vehicle park are the only things at, a, at the town site of Eureka. I'm standing on the right of way and you can see it going up here further. And Eureka is as far as you can drive in a normal automobile. You can't go up uh, further up the uh, right of way because it's restricted to uh, all terrain vehicles only. That doesn't mean you can't take a picture uh, looking at the, the remains of the Sunnyside Mill, which you can see right here. This is the railroad right of way. It made this, it bridged the river and made this sweeping curve to the right. To the right. And these are the inevitable tailings uh, from the mine. All over this area, you see mine tailings. It's unbelievable. And the shops of the Eureka Mine uh, built their own rail car called the Casey Jones. Uh, this car remains in existence. It's owned by the San Juan Historical, San Juan County Historical Society. And it's usually on display at the uh, Silverton uh, Freight Yard Museum. Well, as we said, 1893, things got economically bad in uh, Colorado. So Otto Mears came east to the Washington DC area and he got involved in a uh, railroad there. And unusually for him, it was a standard gauge railroad. Uh, the Chesapeake Beach Railway had been incorporated on March 7th, 1896 as a successor to the Washington and Chesapeake Beach Railway, which was just an attempt to build. Mears acquired his interest in the new corporation on August 21st, 1897, through the purchase of all 3,000 shares of capital stock. He had a partner in this deal, a guy by the name of David H. Moffat, which if you're familiar with Colorado railroad history, uh, should be very familiar to you. 14 miles of track to Marlboro, Maryland was completed on October 20th, 1898 and opened for revenue service as of December 5th, 1898. A Bayfront resort community called Chesapeake Beach was also under development. Rail construction to Chesapeake Beach was completed on March 21st, 1899. The line opened for revenue service on June 9th, 1900. Otto Mears resigned as president of the Chesapeake Beach as of November 1st, 1902, and moved to New York City and became involved with uh, the International Motor Truck Company, which is we know as Mack Trucks. The railroad went into receivership on December 9th, 1910. On April 15th, 1935, the line was shut down and all but a small portion of the line was sold for, for scrap on September 20th, 1935. The surviving portion became the East Washington Railway. And this is an impressive map with all the, these lines on it, but only this little section here in red is their genuine Chesapeake uh, Beach Railroad. And it began in Washington, DC with a connection to, a to the local street railways it was also right next to the Pennsylvania Railroad's bypass around Washington, DC. These ferry lines shown here were never got into operation. And there was no code to what the blue line was. So we'll just say, yeah, there's a blue line there. 
This building in Washington, D.C. still curves to the railroad track location off picture. Actually, you can see it right here. This is uh, one of the catenary towers on the Pennsylvania Railroad's uh, bypass around Washington, D.C. The wire has been taken down, but uh, many of the catenary poles still exist. And this is where the trackage was. East Washington 11 was originally Chesapeake Beach 11, and before that was owned by a subsidiary of the Atlantic coastline. This is a poor image of the rear of a Chesapeake Beach railway train, and there's virtually no remnants of this line between that curved building in Washington, D.C., and when you get uh, to the beach. Chesapeake, the railway trail in Chesapeake Beach, it's actually on the wrong side of the waterway, but uh, it's a great way you can walk along part of the uh, part of the right of way here in Chesapeake Beach. The Chesapeake Beach Station survives as a museum to the railroad, and it's a nice little museum. Basically, uh, you know, the local historical society has. Uh, taken to heart there, uh, the heritage of the community. Uh, the cabs of 11 and 12, those were, they were both four furrows and you saw the 11 earlier. They survived as a shed on the East Washington Railroad. They just pushed the two of them together. Eventually when the East Washington Railroad was abandoned, the people in Chesapeake Beach bought the cabs, had them transported to Chesapeake Beach and they now use them as shelters for picnic tables. Half of the parlor car Dolores served as a shed on the East Washington Railroad. Actually, some people tell me it was a dormitory facility for uh, train crews. Uh, that half of a car has also got, been transported to Chesapeake uh, Beach. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay, as I mentioned, the railroad was a failure. The, attempt to build a beach community in Chesapeake Beach was more or less a failure. There's basically one casino type restaurant located there today. It's, what can I say? Incorporated, Silverton Gladstone and Northerly, incorporated on April 6th, 1899 and opened to Gladstone as of July 2nd, 1899. Owned by the Gold King Mine, leased to the Silverton Northern Railroad as of January 1st, 1910, ending its independent existence after about 11 years. The railroad entered receivership on July 10th, 1915. And by July 23rd, 1915, it was out of receivership and merged into the Silverton Northern. The line was abandoned on November 17th, 1937. And here's Silverton, Gladstone and Northern 32 and their combine number one posing along the line circa 1899. Unusually for the three little lines out in this part of the world, all of this equipment was purchased new. At Gladstone, the Mogul Mill remains still stand above the site of the tracks. Teft Mill Spur. It was a, well, there was a sawmill there. It was located at milepost 478.02 on the Silverton branch. The remains of a spur with some rolling stock rotting away. Well, most of that rolling stock is now either completed rotting away totally or has been uh, hauled away for preservation or restoration. In October 1911, severe weather caused floods that damaged much of the Denver and Rio Grande trackage in Southern Colorado. There was a tremendous demand for timber by the railroad. Outside contractors were also needed to work on the repairs. No less than Otto Mears, the pathfinder of the San Juan, was hired to do work on the Silverton branch of the Denver and Rio Grande, which included the construction of a sawmill along the Animas River. Certain pieces of rolling stock from the three little lines in Silverton were brought into the sawmill site, which was linked to the Silverton line by a spur. The sawmill lasted only a few years in operation. The 1,489 foot long spur was apparently still intact until 1946. Well-known Colorado narrow gauge photographer, Richard B. Jackson explored the Teft Spur site on an unknown date. Here's a view looking down the uh, Teft Spur right of way uh, towards the sawmill. 
the uh, Silverton branches to the photographer's rear. This is one of two Silverton Northern coaches moved to Teft. Side view of the same car. So is this the former Silverton Railroad Red Mountain? We know it's not the uh, Yankee girl as that was a combine, baggage uh, coach combine. Unfortunately, this too, this car body was too far gone to uh, uh, to reclaim and restore. Here's the interior of the car. Some interesting architectural uh, wood pieces though, maybe. Some additional cars at the end of the Teft Spur. Uh, right in here, you can see baggage uh, and express car five, which is now in uh, Silverton. And the remains of Silverton, Gladstone, and Northerly 32 at Teft. Uh, I understand this is basically uh, rusted away in Sick Transit uh, Monday. Okay, the least known narrow gauge remnant in Silverton, uh, Colorado is Otto Mears' former restaurant, their former res residence. And at the time Otto lived, a, lived there, the building ended right here. And there was a two car garage facing this lot on the site. Uh, there was a bay window here and the porch was not enclosed. And when I saw it in 2014, it was available for sale. So next time you're wandering around Silverton, here's something you may wanna take a look for. And Otto Mears, Work done for the day, heads back to the Durango Freight House. Uh, the Durango and Silverton have uh, docents on some of their trains. The docents are in costumes and one of the costumed uh, characters is Otto Mears. Uh, two reading recommendations, Silver San Juan by uh, Mallory Hope Farrell, which covers the Rio Grande Southern and the Rainbow Route, which is by uh, Sloan and uh, Skaronsky. Both uh, good items for your library. Uh, we also have uh, Otto Mears Goes East by, on the Chesapeake Beach Railway. And I don't have a picture of it, but uh, Josie Marie Crumb's uh, Three Little Lines. Uh, all these books, uh, unfortunately, are out of print. But you, if you go look on abebooks.com or some of the other out of print, uh, you'll find them. They ain't cheap though. Rio Grande Southern has been restored and is now running at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Uh, this is the boiler when it was uh, at Strasburg being restored. And notice that this course is got many new parts, uh, parts in it. That's because there was a hell of a dent in that piece of the boiler. But it's been repaired and it's met all the requirements. And another memorial to Otto are the Mack trucks that uh, can be seen on our streets. So thank you for attention to this portion of the show. And uh, if you wanna, uh, if you hit your space bar, you'll unmute if you've got any questions uh, or if you wanna put them through the chat, I will uh, try and answer them. So folks, are we got any questions? Or do you want me just to uh, continue and we'll do questions again at the end? I have one quick question for you. Um, as far as the tailings at a lot of these old uh, mine sites, have you heard anything about anybody wanting to go back through them to basically A, to clean them up and then B, to get whatever ores left out of them? Because I know supposedly they're doing that out on... Um, uh, the old mine that was in Jerome and, and then the mill was down in Cottonwood and they got a whole bunch of uh, tailings down there and they were supposedly going to start reworking that. And that was a few years ago when I last heard that. Uh, that was where the Verde Valley line is still now. I, I can't speak to, uh, to that, although uh, what I can speak to is that those tailing piles are an environmental nightmare. Right, and I think that was part of the reason they were thinking about it in yeah. in Cottonwood or out in Arizona is for twofold is to uh, get the ore out of it still. With today's technology, they can get a lot more out of it apparently. And then second of all, they get rid of it. Yeah, uh, I understand. I, I understand. 
I understand. I they've done that. They've been able to do that with coal in very many places, but uh, I haven't okay. heard of any uh, mine, any reprocessing of tailing projects in uh, this part of Colorado. Anything else, or we're going to hold till uh, the end of the presentation? Okay, let's hold till the end of the presentation. 